speech so that you can record it. So we know how much load and we know how much it's stretched. And those are the kind of, of uh, tests that are run. So um, we're going to do that. And I have literally done this with latex rubber tubing. Here on campus, you go to, I went to the Kim stores, got three different sizes of rubber tubing. Large, medium, small, I got them defined later. First, what we're going to do is look at the small one and the large one, and we're going to pull on them. So literally, I just clamped this <laughs> rubber tubing on the end of a table and then hung uh, weights off the end of it. And what I did is I put on 50 millimeter uh, part dots. And then I took a ruler and measured, I would apply the load, measure how far apart it came. It went, right? That's all I did. Did that for all three tubes except the middle one, the medium sized one is 100 millimeters. This is called the gauge length. Okay, so what we're going to do is go to the next one, and I've got all the, uh, you're going to have to do something like this, okay, for your homework, the three pieces of homework you got to do. So what we've got are, for instance, this is, a, is the small one, I've got the inside diameter and the wall thickness. I figured out what the cross-sectional area is. We're actually now going to but try to give you another reason why we use P over A. I mean, I kind of gave you a logical reason, which is good. But we're, now we're going to come at it from a materials point of view. I have three different sizes of tubing, but it's of the same material. So what I need to take the data I'm going to get, and I want to get some kind of material parameters out of this. But my results from this are just going to be kind of not the same. So, but somewhere in there are some material properties. So what I've got here is, you know, I put on the, uh, some masses and I changed them to force. And here's the lengths that I measured. And then here's the change in length because that's what's important, right? How much was the change in length? And then I did that for the large one, and then I plotted them. A force versus change in length. I don't think those are the same. This is the large one. Essentially, I went up to the same force, weight. It doesn't stretch as far, right? Makes sense. Smaller ones stretch further. I don't see a material parameter in there other than that they kind of bend. <laughs> Oh, the curves are curved. They're not straight. So I'm thinking, okay, now what's different? What's the only thing different between those two tubes? Cross-sectional area. First, you, you might tumble it too as well. It's different volumes. Okay. That's true, but we are looking at a gauge length. So that's fixed between the two of them. So the, out of that volume then comes the cross-sectional area that's different. So what do you do? Well, you take a guess and say, well, I'll take the force and divide it by that area. P over A. And I do that. And jeez, they land right on top of each other. Okay. Wonderful. You have no idea how long it took me to get this on a PDF. It was late last night. <laughs> and I'm getting older. Uh, not that I like to complain about that. You'll get used to it. So then, what did I do? I said, well, that's fine, but I got one more sample. My sample is, is this is the medium length one. Medium sized one. Different uh, ID and and it may have the same wall thickness. But this one has a 100 millimeter gauge length instead of 50. So if I plot that, my original two are on the same line, but my 
the medium, the third one, is not there. So now what's different? I mean, I divided by the cross-sectional area. So they've all been divided by the cross-sectional area. Now what's different? Gauge length. So how do we take into account, and this is how I think they thought about it in the first place. How do we take into account the differences in the gauge length? Say, well, let's just look at it on a percentage basis. Huh? Let's get them so that, you know, change the length, you have the same amount of percent change. And what you really are saying is, is that deformation is uniform. Whether we got it over 10 millimeters or we got it over 12.5 millimeters or 100 millimeters, the percentage change in length is the same. So all I did then is uh, take and divide here. I need to do a little writing. I took and uh, strain is given the symbol epsilon. The force over area is the stress, and we give that the symbol of sigma. Right? And strain is equal to change in length over the original length. You don't divide by the instantaneous length. That's a different kind of strain. We use the simple one. And um, so I plotted them. And not only that, I ran a... Uh, I mean, for a latex rubber tubing, let me tell you. And a ruler I held up that had millimeter markings and held up to see what the, the uh, distance was between the points. This is really good data <laughs> It's for the situation. So what I did is I fit a polynomial, in this case a, th a third degree, but I've done two degree ones, but the third one's just slightly better. Uh, and that R squared means... It ain't going to get any better than this. Right? Uh, so, I've got a curve that fits the, the, uh, the uh, small data really well. And really, if you look at it, that blue triangle is the only one that's basically not on that line. It's pretty darn close. This is really good data. So, well now, I've taken into... So, there must be something really important about this stress-strain thing. Because now I must be looking at real material properties here. Because I've taken into account cross-sectional area and I've taken into account my gauge length. So the next thing is, is I went and I plotted, if you go back to here, you see, whoops, this went out to one, which means it almost doubled in length. Right? 100%, basically. You'll see a few graphs that do it in percent. But we'll, we'll talk about units and stuff a little later. But you'll see that I've come down and, I, and I've, I've cut this off and replotted it so it only goes out to 0 0.3 here. So I'm just looking at that. But I've got the same curve. I just changed my axis so I don't see the rest of the curve. So you can just see this. And I, you know, it's the same curve plotted in there. And then what I did was I took the derivative of that equation because I want the slope, slope of that line. I did that, and you'll see that you get an x ter squared term, an x term, and a, a constant. I want the slope at x equal to 0. And why do I want that? Well, this doesn't come out very well here. This is the proportional limit. Really meaning the strength. Now, some books, and I actually like this, use S for strength. It's a limit. Okay? You don't want to go beyond this stress, which is right here. Whoop, right here. Which is about... Uh, one, we'll come back to units, megapascals, right? Don't want to go past that because this is pretty linear. 
as long as I stay in that region there and don't go beyond, I can say, well, that slope there I'm going to call E. And what have I got? I got sigma is equal to E epsilon. And E is a material property. Okay? And it's also called Young's modulus. So, what I do is I set uh, at x equal to 0, dy dx equals e. And in this case, it will be the 15.56. That's the slope of that line. One of our most